here if I just sit like this, or do we need to lean in close to the microphone? I guess speak up now if you can't hear. Okay. Uh, well, thank you all for joining us, and um, I'd like to thank uh, Joanna Coachella, Alex Ross, Rivka Galchen, and David Samuels for, for joining us tonight for this event. Um, the heading is The Art of Long-Form Journalism, which is a pretty broad category, I think, but um, I think that will lead to some uh, wide-ranging discussion and is, is necessary, really, for uh, to bring these four writers under uh, a single heading, just because even though they might publish in uh, some of the same magazines, yeah, is a very uh, wide range of four different uh, set of preoccupations amongst uh, my panelists tonight. Um, and I think that rather than my just reading their bios to you, which you, uh, which you probably know, uh, maybe we could start off since so many of you are writing students here. Uh, we could hear the go one by one and you could just tell us uh, how you got your start writing and uh, how you ended up where you are today. How long is story to uh, <laughs> An hour or less. Um, I'm a, a staff writer at The New Yorker, where I am the dance critic and one of the book reviewers. Um, I got here by a very circuitous route. Um, and uh, uh, at that time, uh, when I got into dance criticism, there were no graduate programs, or actually maybe two or three in the United States. Um, that trained you to be a dance scholar, um, uh, unlike music or art or whatever. Um, and uh, and I, had, I had been a ballet fan and a ballet student from the time I was a kid, but I intended to be a professor of comparative literature, like Andre, and, uh, and I was getting um, a doctorate um, in comparative literature, and I was going to write a dissertation on Italo Zvevo and Freud, um, but um, I needed money, uh, always a problem. And uh, so I went to work doing something that I had always done uh, to put beans on the table, which is editing, um, um, by which I mean low-level editing, copy editing, line editing. Um, I went to Random House, and for seven years, I worked in their college textbook department on psychology textbooks. And um, during that time, I was very unhappy. Uh, or at least with my work, um, and, um, and I drifted back to a childhood uh, love, which was ballet. Um, and uh, uh, I couldn't really afford to go to the ballet at that time, but uh, uh, there was a woman in the cubicle next to me who said, you know, uh, if you join the New York City Ballet Guild for $50, you can go to the ballet every night if you sell at the gift bar. And that was it. Uh, that was, you know, my life changed that night. Um, and uh, I did, in the end, write the dissertation. Um, because my husband convinced me that uh, it would benefit me, and that I had done all the coursework and passed the orals and so forth. Um, I didn't write it on Italo's Vevo. I, I wrote it on Diagulo's Ballet Roots and somehow managed to sell a conflict department on Complete departments are very vain about their uh, breadth um, and their history of ideas uh, orientation, so they were ashamed to turn me down. Um, <laughs> and, uh, at that, and then uh, I started, uh, I, um, I began writing on dance at the lowest level. Most people do start at a very low level, maybe not as low as I did. And, um, uh, for Dance Magazine uh, in uh, 1980, I guess, and just slowly fingernailed my way up. Um, uh, I never uh, uh, could be without a day job until I went to the New Yorker in 19. Well, I went on, until I went on staff in the New Yorker in 1998. I could never take a taxi cab. I, uh, uh, then I lived, you know, I, I revised um, the abnormal psychology textbook that in the end I wrote. Um, and uh, no, it's true. I, I, uh, abnormal psychology, current perspectives, it supported me through eight editions. <laughs> and finally, David Remnick of the New Yorker um, gave me the money that I earned 
from the abnormal side. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and that's my story. Uh, I didn't have to, I was a dance critic. I learned, as everyone did in those days, about dance by myself by reading and, uh, and by watching, above all. Um, and those were very great days for dance, still, the 70s and 80s. They're not great days for dance right now, and I'm very grateful for my long education in literature, uh, because I spend much more time now uh, reviewing books than I do dance, although in my heart there is a little flame that says that dance will rise again. Um, okay, I, I, and I'm gonna stop there. Monsieur? Yeah, uh, my name is Alex Ross, and I also write for The New Yorker uh, about music, uh, mostly, though I do sometimes write about uh, other subjects. And, yeah, my story is actually uh, not too different from Jones, in that I, I didn't have grand designs growing up to uh, become a, a journalist and really envision myself um, in an academic uh, career, especially uh, after college. I, I applied to grad school, and it was all set to go when uh, sort of opportunities started uh, arising for me to do first uh, freelance work uh, writing about music and then uh, full-time positions and uh, I think I actually I, I didn't do the high school newspaper or a college newspaper or anything like that I, I think I would have been horrified if you told me at the time that I was going to uh, become uh, a journalist or, or a critic I, I just didn't pay much attention to what people were writing uh, about the, the arts, uh, really, in, in newspapers and, and magazines, uh, and was much more focused on, on academic uh, scholarly texts. But I, in college, I, I did spend a lot of time at the radio station, and in, in the course of that work, uh, I started writing uh, you know, CD reviews, uh, as well as interminably long uh, essays that are read aloud on the air for the benefit of you know, <laughs> or, you know, people listening uh, at a given time. And, and, um, and it was that, that was the work that, it's really a couple of friends of mine urged me after college to, to try this kind of writing, and, and uh, they did a lot of the work of, of shopping it around. And uh, I also did a, a hundreds of reviews for a, a CD, uh, classical CD uh, uh, magazine called Fanfare, which they paid two dollars per review. It was about getting the free CDs, uh, obviously. Uh, and uh, and so one thing led to another, and, and I, I, I uh, enjoyed a couple of longer pieces that I wrote for the New Republic, uh, which was really my beginning, uh, official beginning. Uh, and then I went to the Times in 1992 and was their fifth string, uh, uh, sort of barely paid. Uh, classical critic, uh, but I got a great uh, experience uh, just going all around the city, uh, seeing many different kinds of concerts. Uh, and then I started getting uh, pieces about every year or so in, in New Yorker, and then in, in 96 they offered me a full-time job as the new critic, and essentially I've been uh, happy uh, ever since. <laughs> took a longer time to grow up than a lot of other people, which is to say I didn't really rebel until I was maybe 25. So I didn't pursue writing directly, although it was, uh, it was something I was very interested in, but in my family was like, either you're a doctor or a lawyer, or you're probably gonna die in a gutter face down, which I think is because no one in my family was a doctor or a lawyer. And so they had a fantasy that was a really great life. And um, so I went to medical school, and I even somehow finished medical school, and and which was kind of good because it put me under pressure because I knew that I was very unhappy and I knew that I only had like kind of a limited amount of time to get my writing career going before I sort of thought well I really do have to be a doctor so I then um, I'm, I'm a novelist or I'm a fiction writer and a, a journalist although I feel fake calling myself a journalist on this panel but I guess technically I'm allowed to do it because I've written a number Don't of articles so I'll go ahead and do it um, but I really remember I was working on, on my novel and, and um, at the same time my first break really came from, I was sort of obsessed with the Dewey Decimal System updates because they have to keep track of all this new knowledge. So like, you know, Teletubbies didn't used to exist and now there are Teletubbies so there has to be somewhere to file Teletubbies. And so every month there would be these sort of lists coming out that I was somehow interested in and I pitched it to the 
Believer magazine, which didn't get back to me for 11 months. I sort of was like, oh, I thought I'd just like curate a list every month of kind of interesting updates, like Blondes in Literature was like a new update. Or they sort of re, they moved like um, the, the genocide of the Armenians from atrocities, subtitle genocide of the Armenians, to sort of history. It was just like, shifted it. So I, I thought it was a really good idea. And, I assume that no one read my pitch because I'm sure you guys know what it's like. You just send and send and send into like a netherworld. But then somehow 11 months later they said, yeah, okay, like sure. And so I was doing that for free for a while, which means that when I pitched them another sort of generally unvivid bad idea for an article, <laughs> which was about the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is like an interesting subject, but had no, I had no contemporary focus because I didn't know anything about journalism. They gave me a chance, and that was really like how I first got like a full piece written, which that I could then show to Harper's when I came up with like a sort of a more, you know, kind of journalism-ready piece, always just following kind of whatever curiosities I had, like my, my first sort of break was really a piece for Harper's about hurricane control technologies. And um, so it just had like kind of like my nerdy science background suddenly helping me. Um, and and that, that was sort of how I got my start and now I, I write, I have written one novel and I do short stories and I publish in Harper's and a little bit um, in other magazines in the New Yorker, but I'm sort of like the junior the junior person, but that's how I got, that's how I got started. Um, yeah, how did, how did I get started here? I don't know, I grew up in New York, and somehow I went to Harvard, and if you go to Harvard, then you have this credential that lasts you for the rest of your life, where people think you're not insane. And, you know, I, after I got out of Harvard, I think, when I developed a pretty serious substance abuse problem, and I kind of drifted from place to place and tried to write fiction. I was kind of good enough at it that I would get, you know, hand-signed rejection letters from a fiction editor at the New Yorker. Um, and I actually got close enough once where she wrote me a really nice letter which showed that she'd really read my story, and then we, we talked, and. I asked her how much I'd get paid if they actually accepted a story, and she said, I think at the time it was $3,000. Um, and then I asked her how much, how many stories I could sell a year, and she said, well, you'd be very lucky if we included one. And so, so I did the math on that. Um, and then it turned out there was a whole other part of the magazine, um, which had nonfiction reporting. And as far as I could understand it, it was also a kind of writing and an exchange for going to places that other people didn't want to go, like Bosnia, um, during the war, um, they published more articles. And you could get paid, and since you got paid by the word, you could get paid, you know, $15,000 for an article. So that struck me as a good deal. Um, so then I went to Bosnia. Um, <laughs> And that eventually led to me publishing my first piece in Harper's. And I did that for a while, and then the New Yorker started to publish me. And um, I remember I worked really hard writing pieces for the New Yorker. I think I probably published like six of them in two years or something like that. And then um, my editor at the New Yorker took me out to dinner. I published a big piece in the New Yorker that I think was like their best-selling issue of the year next to the 9-11 issue, which I felt had an unfair advantage. <laughs> and um, he said, look, you know, I want to take you out to dinner and tell you this is such a great piece and you know, we really appreciate the work you do and I want you to understand um, something, which is I've seen how hard you're working and I want you to know that you're really not going to ever get a job here. Um, <laughs> and and, and I, I, it really wasn't the message that I was anticipating because, you know, he took me out to dinner. Um, and uh, I said, you know, Henry, what, what, what do you mean? Um, and, and, and he explained, he was like, well, you know, do you, you know, 
Do you intend to take direction from other people? Is there some specific beat that you want to cover? Is there anything that you actually know about? Is there any kind of regular <laughs> work that you're capable of doing? And I looked at him and I was like, no. And he said, well, we can't employ people like that, David. You know, we're, you're really going to have to find a way to you know, support yourself that's not us, but we you know, love to continue to publish your work. And I, you know, I was really sad for like a week. Um, and then I was like, well, you know, this is actually good because I remember when I did have food and, and now I have food. Um, and so ever since then I've kind of continued, you know, I do maybe a piece, long piece a year for the New Yorker, a long piece a year for Harper's, I do long pieces for the Atlantic. They're kind of these very long kind of reportage where I kind of put my messed up subjectivity in some weird relation to some group of people that interests me and that, you know, I either find a narrative in that or, you know, I find a story like, you know, Balkan Jewel Thieves or something that has a exciting enough pre-existing narrative that maybe it might sell the movies or something. Um, and that's what I do. Well, uh, maybe another question for all four of you. Um, people seem to really could talk about hopscotching from subject to subject and, and David sort of doing the same. And I wondered how that, if you could describe that process, and how do you, how do you find your topics? Is it serendipity, or do you have a more methodical process of finding what you're going to write about in a given month or week or whatever it might be? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I have specific beats. I mean, I'm, I'm a dance critic, um, and so and I'm the only dance critic at the magazine. So, um, but there's lots of dance to talk about. Um, uh, not lots of dance. That, you know, uh, since the recession, things have changed. The New Yorker. I don't know where they have it, Harper's, but I'll bet you they have. Not at all. Um, <laughs> um, uh, they want less dance, uh, uh, partly because of space, um, and partly because, as I said, things are a little um, dead at the moment in dance. Uh, by reason, dance is a small field, so if two people die, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, and believe me, two people died. Um, the, uh, Are there two people in the audience? <laughs> no, in the, in the last 10 years, um, all the major giants of ballet uh, have died. Um, major giants, all the giants of ballet, um, actually on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, have died. And so we were kind of in tough times. Um, and nobody came up during the 90s and the 10s the way they had during the 80s. Uh, during the 80s, uh, Mark Morris and, and uh, Bill T. Jones and, and I guess Forsyth. But, uh, so, I'm sorry. Um, uh, with regard to how do you get your assignments, I make up, be, being a dance critic is great, in a way, because nobody knows anything about dance. So, um, whereas in movies, they'll actually probably tell the movie critics, we want you to do War Horse, please. Um, the, uh, in dance, they don't. Um, uh, so I kind of make up a schedule, and then they dump about half of it, and then I, I do the rest. Um, with books, on which I now spend more time than dance, um, uh, I'd say that it's about half, no, all right, 60% of the time I come up with the title, and 40% of the time Henry Fender does, the book reviews editor. Um, and uh, I can turn down his ideas, and he can turn down my ideas, but we negotiate. Um, he, uh, there's certain specific, there's certain things that I'm most interested in. The novel, religion, uh, and what else? That's basically it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, and so he's kind enough uh, to shoot those things my way. Um, uh, for a while there I enjoyed writing about uh, more fun things like uh, child rearing and you know girl things, uh, child rearing <laughs> food. You know they were always happy to send me those things, and uh, uh, the family. Um, and somehow I don't want to do them anymore. Uh, and, and so that's it. It's it's all negotiation at the New Yorker. 
Um, is that true of you, Alex? Do you pick um, what you're gonna, what content you're gonna review? Uh, yeah, for the most part. You know, there's always a bit of negotiation, but uh, I, I tend to come in with a bunch of ideas and, and run them past my editor, and, uh, and some seem to go over better than others. Uh, but if I feel strongly enough, passionate enough uh, about a subject, even Me if too. there's doubt, even if there's uh, yeah. reluctance, uh, if, I, if I make the case and just continue pressing it, um, then, then I can do it, which, which is a fantastic thing. Me too. And so there have been uh, yeah, several pieces of, over the years that have really been on, on pretty obscure topics. I remember when Tina Brown was the editor, and, and uh, I was convinced that we had to write a huge piece on the German late romantic composer Hans Fitzner, uh, whose opera Palestrina was being produced, and, and no one had heard of uh, Fitzner, and I just somehow had worked up enough of an <coughs> air of, of uh, uh, enthusiasm. It was beyond enthusiasm. We, did, we just had to write the piece about yeah. Fitzner. It was just, yeah. like, we, just, we just could not write the piece about Fitzner, and, and so it happened. And, uh, but you know, the, the uh, people today at the, at the magazine are, are very uh, responsive uh, to you know even my, and I've become a good I think self editor. You know, sometimes doing uh, the more obvious thing, and, and sometimes uh, uh, something a bit more esoteric. And, and yeah. it's just healthy for me, you know, not always to be uh, pursuing my, my private passions, but also just to be paying attention to the stuff that everyone else is is talking about, and just being a journalist reporting on. The, the events uh, in, in my sphere, whether I find them unbelievably interesting or not. So it's, uh, it's gotten, gotten to be, I do spend a, a lot of time agonizing over what, what to review, what to write about. I don't like to, to end up being locked into, yeah. you know, a, yeah. that's, this is just very distressing when I just find myself <laughs> carrying out an idea that was just, you know, not Do you find there are parts of music that you just don't want to review, even though maybe you should? Sure, but I sort of try to, to yeah. push myself to think yeah. about the menu. Yeah, I don't particularly like bad, writing bad reviews anymore. When I was younger, I loved it. I just like <laughs> stick, <laughs> stick a knife in them. It was great. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and I was smart and they were dumb. But, uh, <laughs> you know, now I don't know. I've, uh, um, but I, like Alex, I, I guess I didn't think of it until you said it, but um, I write for a general interest magazine. Um, so does Alex. Um, and I, does, does, the Harper, does Harper's think of itself that way? We do. All right. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, m my mother is much more likely to read The New Yorker than to read Harper's. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there are cartoons in The New Yorker. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, so I know that when Paul McCartney writes the score, for a new ballet at New York City Ballet, I know that I will be reviewing that. Right. Well, no, I, I think that at Harper's there's not the same, well, I, I, don't, know, I don't know if this really exists at the New Yorker, but there were not a, the magazine of record in any way. So we could skip any TV show, movie, book, and it won't matter. Yeah. Um, and on the flip side, we're happy to devote pages to something that's completely obscure, like, you know, Fitzner would have been perfect for us, um, <laughs> and we and we won't worry too much about it. Um, so I mean, that might be a slight difference there, but we can't have a whole magazine of that. So, and so to maintain the illusion of being general interest, you know, we yeah. we like to mix in, you know, Woodstock '99 to go along. Um, it's it, uh, I'll shut up in a second, but uh, it's changed at the New Yorker. Uh, I remember I can't remember when. Uh, Madonna made her movie called Truth or Dare, but it, what do you think? Maybe ten years ago, fifteen years ago? I don't think that was but, uh, twenty. 20, 20, 20 years ago. Okay. I always, I always yeah. force you at the time, but anyway, twenty years ago. So I said to the man who was then the movie reviewer at the New Yorker, uh, Terrence Rafferty. I said, "Well, you know, what'd you think of it? When are you going to write about it?" He said, "I wouldn't write about that piece of garbage." Um, and that was okay at the New Yorker twenty years ago. Now. If Madonna made a movie, or you know, if Lady Gaga made a movie, it would be reviewed. As I said, when Paul McCartney wrote the score for a ballad, which did indeed uh, uh, happen uh, about five months ago, um, it'll get reviewed. Yeah, I, f I find um, I find that I like find my ideas basically by 
by pursuing awkward, awkward social situations with people that I don't have anything in common with or know. So I sort of find like the best way for me to get ideas has always been um, to go to situations I vaguely dread with people I don't really know. And then I learn something because I have nothing to do strategically, socially. My only strategy is just to ask people, oh really, and what else, and what else, and what else. And so I, I remember, um, for example, I, I, was, I was living in Berlin for a while, and I was um, constantly in this situation um, of brunches. I, I just don't really, you know, I sort of think, you know, everyone sort of ends up doing what they love is usually what they hate. And I actually, like, hate talking to people, which means I must really crave it and love it, and therefore I'm afraid of it, and so don't do it. So that's why I think I, like, pursue journalism, where you have to talk to people again and again and again, and every time you dread picking up the phone or every time you dread meeting them for coffee. So I find that dread really useful, because I know that I'm getting somewhere good when I don't want to be there. And so I find almost all my ideas have come from that sort of setting. And they're almost always like bad ideas, which I think is not a, a, a terrible way to go. For example, my most, my most, the piece I have coming out in the New Yorker soon came from sort of um, learning about this dead writer, which is always a bad pitch. You sort of say to the magazine, oh, there's this dead writer who no one in this country reads. And uh, I thought it would be interesting to do a piece about him, even though there's nothing visual and there's no scene. So I learned about this guy, Carl May, who's a sort of great, um, interest, you know, German writer. Wrote like 70 books. A lot of them took place in the American West. He'd never been to the American West. And of course, as soon as you start digging, it's amazingly interesting. And then you meet the people who know a lot about it, and they're very interesting. And that's like a very David sort of a piece, where like a lot of the pieces, this sort of culture around this thing, whatever it might be. And so I found that like I I got that idea from from being in a social setting that, that was uncomfortable for me and learning about things I don't know anything about. Um, and, and you know, my, I, I just find that's really useful. Like I remember I did a, a piece for Harper's that was also just sort of basically a bad idea. And that's what's great about being a fiction writer is is people think like, well, I don't know, she'll she'll do something <laughs> with it. Like she knows how to write a scene. And so I pitched them a piece about an Argentine writer that also nobody in this country really knows about or reads, although now I think maybe a little bit more, called Cesar Ira, who also is like oddly prolific and sort of philosophical and odd and difficult, and I was like, I just thought I wrote a profile of him. I don't know why it would be interesting. I'm, you know, like, there, and it's just one of those things where you just, um, I almost think you can make a niche where you're like, I promise somehow it'll work out even though my pitch doesn't sound very good. So I think that's the other thing that's possible when you're kind of, in a weird way, like, have the luxury of being not so you know, you don't know that much about something, but, and so somehow you have to turn it into your virtue. And so I do think that's like an, that's an option, but you do, I think, have to start build up a little resume of having had ideas that don't seem like they're going to work that somehow pan out. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah no, I, I, I identify with the part about finding normal social interaction problematic. Um, and, and my response to that usually is that I get fixated on something weird that I read in the newspaper, um, and then I think about it for too long, and then I want to go there. Um, and then once you're out of New York, it's kind of amazing how one thing, you know, can lead to another. I'll, I'll give you an example, actually. It's funny because it, it, it includes both of my, you know, part-time homes, part person the New Yorker. Um, so a while back, this is like, I don't know, seven years ago, I guess, eight years ago, there was a big fuss about this place called Yucca Mountain in Nevada, which was a huge mountain in the desert that they were hollowing out and they were going to store all the nuclear waste in America inside this one mountain. And at the time, there was an editor that I knew who I was friends with at a men's journal who kept being like, don't you want to write something about nature? And I was like, no, I, I don't like nature. Um, <laughs> it's like, we are a really good writer. We'd love to have you. Da, 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 da. Just think about something having to do with nature. And I was like, OK, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. 
Um, but then I really needed some money, and, and I was thinking about nature. And I was like, I don't know, does that hollowed out mountain in the desert where they're going to store all the nuclear waste count as nature? Because, because I'd want to see that. Um, and so I called him up and I was like, hey, is, is that nature? And, and he was like, you know, sure. Um, and I was like, okay, like, I want to go there and I want to go inside the mountain. Um, and yeah, like, if you work up ahead of steam and people think you're a weirdo and you have, like, a history of writing about weird stuff, and people go against their first instinct, which is like, that's boring or that doesn't make any sense. And they're like, oh, that's probably good. I just don't understand it. And so he was like, okay, here's this money, go to the mountain. So, so I'm there in this middle of this mountain, which had been hollowed out, but there was nothing inside it because they hadn't put the nuclear waste there. It was just like going inside a mine. And it was exceptionally boring and, and a bad idea for an article. Um, and so I'm standing there in a hard hat in the middle of this mountain, and I'm talking to this, this engineer who worked there, and I was like, man, this is really interesting. They're going to they're gonna put all the nuclear waste here. And he was like, this isn't very interesting. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. I guess you're right. Um, and he was like, but, you know, there's something a lot more interesting, you know, three hours here, you know, on, on the other side. And I was like, what's that? He was like, it's the Nevada test site. And I said, oh, is that where they race the cars? to see how fast they go. And, and, and he was like, no. <laughs> I was like, well, what is it? And he was like, well, that's where we used to test nuclear bombs. And I had like a vague memory that such a place existed. And um, I was like, yeah, I, I heard something about that, but didn't they mostly test bombs in the Pacific or something? And he was like, oh, that was, you know, they did a few atmospheric tests, but we tested a lot of bombs. And I was like, well, how, how many bombs did you test? And he was like, well, over a thousand. And I was like, so you mean like right over the mountains over there, you blew up a thousand nuclear bombs? And he was like, yeah. He was like, we used to, I was like, so you used to set off three or four nuclear bombs a week? He was like, yep. And I was like, can I go there? And he was like, sure, I still have my pass. I was like, no, so can we go there now? And he was like, yeah. I was like, all right, well, let's get out of this mountain, you know. And so, so we drove, like, three hours, and he showed his badge, and suddenly we're in the middle of this landscape, which is, like, green, because they'd blown up nuclear bombs there, and so the sand had been turned into this green glass, um, which has a name that I forget. Um, Trinitite. Trinitite, that's My correct. grandfather analyzed it. Trinitite, that's exactly right. I'm a piece of it somewhere. Um, and so then I became obsessed with the Nevada test site, and you know I found out all this extraordinary stuff, like you know of all the all of the data from the thousand and sixty one tests or whatever it was that they did there it was less than one second of data, um, because of course it happened so fast, and also there were all these jobs and people would come to work. And there was the guy that put the wires together and the guy that buried it in the hole, and, and I became obsessed with kind of finding these people and seeing what their lives were like now and putting together the story of this place. And I ended up doing this long piece for Harper's called Buried Sons um, about the test site. Um, and, um, and what was fun was the juxtaposition of this kind of end of the world thing and this everyday job that these people would work and then like sort of what the effect on them was now. Like these kind of guys bouncing off the walls in Vegas with these memories of blowing up a thousand bombs and like they sounded insane except it was their lives. And, a symptom of the larger insanity that we lived during the whole <laughs> um, And um, so during the course of the fact-checking process for the, for the piece, um, you know, I drove the fact-check. One of the wonderful things about you know, Harper's, I love writing for Harper's. I got my start there. I'm really a Harper's writer in terms of voice and approach. Um, but there are amazing things about the New Yorker, too. You know, first of all, they pay more money. And, and second, um, they have something called a fact-checking department, um, which when you do very complex pieces is actually an essential part of your work. Harper's at the time had a young woman who was 23 and who graduated from a liberal arts college. And so when I dumped a, two duffel bags of you know, stuff about physics and nuclear testing on her, um, desk, she had some kind of a breakdown, and, and, um, <laughs> and it was very upsetting for her. Um, she still won't talk to me. Um, and so during the course of this, I was going through these descriptions of them putting wires together and putting the hemispheres of you know, a, a bomb together. 
And I realized that I had no idea what they were really talking about. And, and I had these physical descriptions from the guys putting these bombs together, but I didn't know exactly how they fit. And so I started asking questions. I'd call, you know, the Department of Energy and work my way up and be like, can you tell me what the red wire is and the blue wire? And they were like, no. <laughs> and finally I started getting to this level of general. I was like, can you tell me just the basics of how a nuclear warhead works? They're like, no. <laughs> and finally I met with the head of Los Alamos Nuclear Laboratory and I was like, so can you explain what this is? And he was like, no. And, um, and this like went on for about a month. And um, finally I, I was digging around and it turned out that um, Blake Gopnik, who was Adam Gopnik of the New Yorker's brother, was an art critic for the Washington Post, <laughs> had done a review of an art show by an artist who had actually presented, a, among other things, a molded, exact version of the Hiroshima um, bomb, and with all the parts supposedly correct, and I was like, well, where the hell did he get that? Um, <laughs> and so I talked to the artist, and he was like, well, I got that from John Coster Mullen. And I said, well, who's that? And he said, well, he's got a book on Amazon. And I was like, well, what's the publisher of the book? And he's like, what's a Xerox thing that he made? <laughs> and it's available on Amazon for $50. And I said, well, where does he teach? And he said, well, he drives a truck. Um, and then I was like, well, that doesn't sound very likely to me. <laughs> but then I started investigating it and, it turned, and then I talked to the former head of the Los Alamos Nuclear Laboratory and I said, do you know this guy John Coster Mullen? And there's this silence. And he was like, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what do you think of his book? He was like, I actually had to blurb his book. If you get it, you'll see that I say that this is, and I was like, okay, this is getting interesting. And it turned out, you know, one thing led to another, and it was a footnote in the Harper's piece, but it turned out that there was a truck driver in Wisconsin who, because he was a complete obsessive, and weirdly had a whole bunch of backgrounds that allowed him to gather and sort of integrate this information, was the one person who had actually drawn a correct <coughs> diagram of how at least an early nuclear bomb worked. Um, and in the process proved that, you know, Richard Rhodes' account of the mechanics of the bomb and the making of the atomic bomb, which won the Pulitzer Prize, was actually completely wrong. <laughs> um, and I talked to Rhodes, and I was like, really? This truck driver proved you wrong? He was basically like, sadly, yes, you know, he's right, and I'm wrong. <laughs> and so then I ended up writing a profile of him for The New Yorker, where I drove across the country with him to this model of the bomb he put together, which was like locked in some abandoned Air Force facility in Utah. Um, so that's how I get my ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this is a bit of that. I, uh, when I read about John Adams' uh, opera, Dr. Atomic, and uh, going to the Trinity site, which is, you know, it, when I write a, a big piece, I just, I like to think, well, how can I push this a little further, you know, beyond there's a man in Berkeley who's written a new opera, and sort of, you know, watching them put that together. So I, I persuaded my editor to let me go to Trinity and, and walk around. And it didn't really have a whole lot to do with the rest of the article, but it was sort of a nice, pretty, you know. Uh, well, I, I wanted to ask, actually, both of you, when you're working on a piece that's going to be a longer piece uh, for The New Yorker, you know, not a review, but where you're going to do scene reporting and that kind of thing. Do you switch gears entirely in your brain, or is it the extension of the same process that you use to do the shorter pieces, or how does it work? I switch gears. Um, uh, well, for one thing, very often with longer pieces, unless they're books pieces, but um, if it's a profile, you have to interview them. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, 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 one theme that is going up and down this table is social phobia. Um, <laughs> and, um, but I don't know whether it's just writers or whether they just pretend that they don't like parties. But um, but uh, I'm very bad at interviewing people, and I'm very embarrassed to interview people. I don't like to ask them questions about their lives. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the New Yorker makes you pay for transcribing. I just hate every moment of it. Um, and I only write uh, profiles of people that I admire so much that I can't bear that there isn't a profile. Alexei Ratmansky was the last one. Um, but yeah, I switch gears. You know, I'll see this uh, and, you know, don't quote me, but I, I feel as though as a dance critic I know exactly what I'm doing. I know, uh, which is not to say that I don't get horribly nervous and have a breakdown before I have to begin, just as I always do. But with you know, reviewing a, a ballet, I just know how to do it by now. 
which, which I should after 30 years, you know? Um, and, and they're short. The uh, 1,400 words is what I have right now. Um, but when it's a longer piece, um, it's sort of like, I mean, you know what David and Rivka were saying to you, the, the thing between the lines there, the, you know, the secret they don't tell you, is that really a piece, you may think you have a boring subject, but truly the, the virtue of the piece is, is uh, the interestingness of the writer's thoughts. If the writer is a good thinker, an interesting thinker, the piece will be interesting, even if it's about the Dewey Decimal System. You know? um, and, uh, um, and so, I, I think probably with longer pieces, the thing I'm always most nervous about is whether I'll have an interesting thought. Uh, I'm not that nervous anymore about whether I can write a sentence or a paragraph. Um, uh, and I'm not that changeable anymore. <laughs> the, uh, there's, there's not that much room for improvement. <laughs> there's no, there's not much hope for improvement anymore. But do you feel that way that with reviewing, that you basically can kind of come in on your roller skates? Yes, I mean, yeah, I sort of figured that out relatively early on. <laughs> um, yeah, or, or the 18th century, 18th century equivalent. But um, yeah, I mean, that was. Uh, I mean, I, I work hard at the reviews and sometimes yeah. stumble against some some obstacle, uh, or I'm just sort of dissatisfied with the result. But uh, yes, those and and the essays uh, on on the dead composers, uh, and the, the the structure is becomes quite evident to me uh, early on, and, I, and I've been gathering material for, for many years uh, in some cases, and, and really know exactly where yeah. I want to begin. When I wrote about the 16th century uh, Italian composer Gesualdo uh, uh, over uh, about a month ago in, in The New Yorker, it was, you know, it was just very obvious that I was going to begin with the night that he uh, murdered his <laughs> wife and her, and her lover. Uh, of course! <laughs> <laughs> it was really, you know, that was really part of the justification for the whole piece. Yes, it's, it's, just, it's, the, it's the bloodiest, most learned incident in the entire history of, of classical music. <laughs> so uh, it was just uh, probably the best lead that a lover had. But um, in, the, uh, in the case of the profiles, yeah, it took me a long time to become comfortable with the profiles because I was just much less sure of myself. I didn't have the experience uh, with this kind of journalistic writing. And, and I'm very dissatisfied with the first couple of long profiles that I wrote for The New Yorker. The problem was I just had this methodology. I had uh, questions and went in and sort of asked a bunch of questions and wrote down the answers and went home and started writing, mm -hmm. starting to write the piece and kept thinking there's so much else that I've missed, the atmosphere and, and, the, and the, the, the sort of minor details of what people were doing and what they were wearing and all, all of that. And, and I just lacked all of that. So I was just really yeah, struggling. That business of so, saying they were in the blue yeah. tone. And then, you know, oh, right. you know, when I wrote about the <laughs> radio head was, when I wrote about radio for New Yorker, that was just sort of a turning point because uh, I just realized, all right, this is a complicated situation. There are these five guys. Some of them are easier to talk to than others. And they're playing all over Europe and, and in America. And I just wrote everything down, yeah. page after page after page. And then uh, it's like shooting a film, and you have all you know, extra footage, and then you're editing it together in, in the editing room. And, and now it's progressed to the point where I'm, when I'm doing these profiles, uh, I actually have the sense right away, uh, aha, you know, I just some sort of trivial thing is happening in front of me, but, but I, I, I think to myself, I can use this at the, at the beginning of the piece. I still write down everything anyway, yeah. uh, but I, I, I now have those instincts to, to know what happening, what that's happening in front of me, uh, I'll be able to use uh, in, in the piece itself. So it's just, that, that is what is, I, I need the most practice with over the years. The, profile. the uh, problem with the long pieces for me is that I, um, uh, I read a very great deal. Um, and uh, I think all journals are often in the position of not being expert in the thing that they're writing. I mean, I can write about George Balanchine pretty well, but I write about a lot of other things besides George Balanchine. And um, so I, I read a lot, and I take a lot of reading notes. And so I end up with an outline that's, well, it's as high as the ceiling. It, it, I mean, I have to cut it up, and I paste it on the wall. But, and then I have to eliminate huge amounts of material. Uh, but also with profiles, 
I'm always worried whether the piece person will like me afterwards. Um, I, I like my subjects dead. Um, and, uh, and there are a number of people who, if they were hit by a truck tomorrow, I would write a profile on them, but not now. Um, I always, uh, if I've met them, uh, and indeed sat with them, which if you write, you know, with Ratmansky, this last one I did, you know, I was with him asking questions for five times an hour and a half. Would be uh, seven and a half hours, something like that. Yeah. So seven and a half hours I sat with this man. Um, and and also, you know, artists have a pretty hard job. Um, and uh, um, I've written about a lot of them. My heart, you, you two are, are quite a kind writer. I believe. I mean, I find you that way. Of course, you and I know some real shits, right? So, um, the, um, uh, so the, you know, there are uh, reviewers who specialize in being mean. Um, but uh, as I said, I, I don't like it anymore, although I did, did once. But uh, when, if I know the artist or have sat with him or her for a while, then when I have my pen poised to say he has a weakness for sentimentality, or he really had 15 good years and they were ended 10 years ago, I can see their face in front of my face. And, uh, and it, it, it grips me. And it stops you? Uh, it depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the kind of thing they publish on politics in the New Yorker, kind of thing, like Remnick wrote a piece on Clinton once, I'll never forget, you know, talk about how Clinton walks into the reporter's room and won't shut up and won't go away. Um, the New Yorker's political pieces, political profiles, they like them mixed. They don't like them, uh, I mean, I, don't, couldn't, I couldn't write those things, but, uh, but I sure like to read them. Do you think that's defensible? Like, are the stakes different in an artistic profile versus a political profile? Yes, I think so. Uh, I, I, I'd take me a minute to defend that. But, well, no, I can defend it right away. Barack Obama is going to have an influence over my life. Andrea Ratmansky is not going to hurt you. Um, the, um, so, um, and uh, I mean, I'm sure that Remnick has as much feeling for the difficulty of their job as, uh, as I do for the difficulty of the artist's job. But, uh, you know, artists in the end don't make that much money. And um, they're subject to criticism, and, and they're not egomaniacs like everybody who's been elected beyond the post of, of state assemblyman. And um, uh, I just, uh, you know, I've written on them so many times. I have a whole book of, you know, profiles, long essays on artists. Um, their job seems to me um, uh, full of risks. Um, uh, needing a kind of flexibility that would be hard for me to muster. Um, uh, they face failure. Big flops. So you have sympathy for them. You bet. Well, I, I get the feeling that David might disagree in part with some of this. I'm just thinking of the line in your uh, essay collection where you say the first rule of being a magazine writer is to be ungrateful. Um, yeah, I don't think that you... Ungrateful for what? Ungrateful for the water that someone gives you. Ungrateful for the fact that someone has given you an hour and a half of their time and they're famous and wealthy and you're not. Um, I think there are a lot of, I mean, especially now, I mean, it's different if you're writing about a, you know, refined choreographer who eats out a living while, you know, living his fabulously decorated Chelsea studio, um, but when you're dealing with people who exert real, whether it's cultural influence, political influence, economic influence, at this point the um, art of restricting reportorial access and controlling uh, other people's perceptions has become so highly refined that I think that it takes a great deal of aggression to simply have an honest perception of the person in front of you and make an honest evaluation of the work. I swear when I read, you know, political coverage, you'd think Barack Obama was 
a genius. You think that half the movies that come out are works of great imagination. You think that the world is populated by, you know, literally dozens of amazing novelists under the age of 30. Um, you know, and basically it's all really shit, isn't it? Um, you know, except for one or two things which are exceptionally good. And those things are really, really precious. Um, and the ability to tell the difference between the two, I think, is crucial to, you know, having a culture that has any um, grounding to it and that presents people with worthy objects of emulation. And so, you know, I am not a big believer in, you know, being nice. I'm a big believer in being able to actually see what's in front of me and it's very hard. It's very hard in most of the settings in which you're allowed yeah. access to people. Um, I have to say I really do disagree with you completely. <laughs> um, that um, I've spent a lot of my life uh, writing about art of the second rank because that's what you do if you're a reviewer. Most of the work you see is it's it's not Matisse. It's, it's not Balanchine. And uh, I like to see the arts go on. I like to see them go on from day to day. Um, and so I, I, I think it's a good idea to write about art of the second rank, which is most art, or second and third rank. Um, and, uh, but that's because our jobs are so different. You're writing about stuff on a regular basis, year in and year out, I'm going to find something and spend six or nine months thinking about that one thing. And if I don't have yeah. a perception of that thing that seems absolutely true to me and as deep as I can get and that I can read it 15 years later and feel that that's not just an evaluation that I'd be comfortable giving to people in a social context in a moment, but that I'd want someone to read 15 years later and all the second rank stuff has kind of passed away and be like, that was a true perception of a moment or a person. That's the only thing I care about. If I haven't done that, then what I've wasted my nine months. Like, yeah. That's a lot yeah. of time. I think, yeah, I mean, well, uh, John and I are just in a different position where we're critics. Uh, we're, we're not always kind uh, in our reviews. Uh, and in a sense, uh, we, we run the gamut uh, uh, from, from, from the strongly positive to the strongly negative. I think when we turn to the, to the writing of a profile uh, of a longer essay, uh, in those cases, it's, it probably will uh, address uh, someone that we respect, you know, and, and uh, we just don't have that many opportunities to write a, a long piece uh, about a composer uh, or a, a choreographer, uh, and it, it would just be a tremendous waste <laughs> <I> think, <laughs> for me just to 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 uh, uh, spend all that time on on a, on a on a fairly good but, but not extraordinary violinist, you know. And actually, in my field, in, in classical music, uh, there there are so many people who are very good. They are adept at what they do. There there aren't that many. Uh, really, sort of uh, rank incompetence uh, running around, uh, but you know the the, the extraordinary, uh, the, the really visionary people are much more rare. But but yes, I am going to uh, to take the opportunity to to uh, spend some time with those people, with uh, Mitsuko Uchida uh, or uh, John Adams or someone who's, whose work I find really compelling. It's a valid piece of my time. But yeah, I have the luxury of you know, then stepping up as a critic and then talking about uh, the, the, the rest of the picture. Uh, and, and, and above all, I, just, I need to be honest you know, about my uh, about my enthusiasms, and, and, and I, I, I can't check myself when, when I'm feeling uh, enthusiastic, and also can't check myself uh, when, when I'm feeling negative. And I'm satisfied with the work. If you know, ten years down the line, I look back and say, you know, yes, I felt that way, and I and I caught it uh, on paper. This all makes me wonder if you, if one has to have, I guess, a, a theory of journalism in order to practice it. Um, do you have to sort of agree with David that uh, you have to be grateful, or that with Janet Malcolm that what you do is morally <laughs> indefensible, or, or if that's not necessary, I guess, to, 
to do your interviews and to investigate whatever you're investigating. I mean, I, I, I would say that my, my theory of journalism doesn't simply rest on, you know, ingratitude. That's only one part of it. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I have a strong, you know, belief, I guess, in, I guess, the inevitability of my own subjectivity ultimately being the subject of whatever I write and I feel I always have to, it's one of the reasons that I love reporting is that I can really dig deeply into names and dates and books and interviews and notebooks and this and that, but in the end when I'm done, if the piece is anything other than, you know, hack work, because I'm really hungry, um, it's a record of something, of an emotional state that I was in, in that moment, in my life, and that ends up, if it's successful, in some way merging with some set of descriptions of people and places, and it's all one thing. And the thing that I can always do is be, is have an absolute fidelity to what it really felt like to me, what I really saw. I don't believe in anything outside of that. I don't. And I know when I look back at work that I've done, the stuff that always makes me cringe is when I tried to write something that wasn't actually the thing that I felt, but I tried to shade it because I felt that that thing was wrong or improper or would offend someone or maybe other people think something else so I should split the difference. And you can find those moments. And every time I see them, I'm like, ugh, like that was a false no, you know. That's why I don't like doing profiles. Because mm. I, 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 I rarely write profiles. I feel as though I, I need to be kind. You know the Europeans, European journals think we're just a bunch of Nazis. Yeah. Um, uh, European journalists? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know there was such a thing. You don't know that they're English book reviewers? There's English book reviewers. I mean, there's critics, there's reviewers. They're talking about journalists. They don't really have journalists. They have these people that like are paid by Silvio Berlusconi and they, and they catch people in like with hookers and they take photographs and then they engage in blackmail and then they get a payoff from some other politician. Yeah. Well, uh, um, uh, I don't have to tell you the difference between um, our news programs and the BBC. Um, the, uh, um, I mean, those people are so astonishingly rude that um, I, it just takes my breath away. But if you talk to the English, um, they'll say to you, you guys are just such blithering idiots, you're such patsies, you're such fools. Um, you know, that, uh, but, uh, but I, I can tell you, one thing I do read is dance reviews uh, from the continent and, and England, and uh, um, they can be uh, very nasty in a very sarcastic and self-enjoying way. Um, the, uh, which tends not to be rewarded in the United States. Do you hold out those same models that David mentioned, you know, Joan Didion or Tom Wolfe or Joseph Mitchell? Or uh, certainly Joan Didion. I, I enormously admire Joan Didion. It's one of the great pieces of writing in the last hundred years, in, in my opinion, is the piece about the Hoover Dam and just how she makes this this sort of explosive, passionate piece <laughs> about about the Hoover Dam. It's just it's an object lesson in, in, in uh, the, the power of language to to bring any subject to life. But uh, but actually, I don't really try to imitate her. I just regard her with with awe from, from a certain distance. Uh, and it's really my you know my my colleagues at the at the New Yorker. I. I emulate most of all, particularly when I'm doing sort of the complicated uh, reported piece. Uh, you know, David Graham, who has the, the office right next to me, has the, uh, this, this extraordinary ability to spin out a story and, and to take you in, in unexpected uh, directions and, and, to, and to weave uh, this, this incredibly rich narrative from, from, a, from a pile of facts. And so, uh, and, and it's the kind of writing that, that, I, that I don't do at all. I don't write about murders and, and, and war zones, but, but there's, there's technical tricks uh, that I can think of from, from looking at, at a piece like that and, and seeing how it's put together and how he pivots uh, from, from, from one moment to another, and, and, I can, and, and I can really really learn from it and, and, and apply something in my own work. Yeah. Right. 
Oh, yes. Okay. Well, I think, uh, how much time do we have? About 20 minutes for questions, I think. Um, so, yeah, we can have some from the audience. If there are any. So, uh, uh, yeah, there in the back, just stand up and speak as loudly as possible. Trends in long-form journalism in the next year. Next year? If, if any, yeah. What the, it's going to get short. <laughs> the question was what, what kind of new trends are coming up in long-form journalism? What are the new trends coming up in the next year in long-form journalism? You guys do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think a year is hard to say because it's so short. short yeah. um, and I'm like the last person to speak to this, but I hear interesting things are happening on the web. Like everyone, everyone talks about the short. Yeah, yeah, everyone keeps talking about the short attention span, which is which is one thing. But I also think it doesn't cost money to run a piece really long on the web. And and uh, and I, I you know actually like a, a friend of mine who now writes for the sports site Grantland. It's like one of these people who's got a sort of, you know, a problem, a graphomaniac problem. And, and I always felt he was an amazing writer, and I would send his essays to, like, my contacts at magazines, and they, you know, were never able to really take them. And then he sort of won some award at longreads.com for, like, long reads on the web and this and that. And I don't know if it's actually true, but I feel like there might be a space for, like, long-form journalism in the place that everyone's talking about being the shortened attention span. I just don't feel, like, expert on it myself, but... Yeah, whether anyone's going to be paid for that work is another question. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it's an infinite possibility. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I see... You know, these magazines still continue to exist that, that uh, publish uh, longer pieces, and, and I feel they're going to stay around for a while at least. Uh, criticism, you know, what Joan and I do, is in, is in uh, dire shape. Uh, I, I would not be surprised if most of these jobs um, that, that exist, well, the relatively few that, that still exist in, in dance and in classical music, really in movies, books, uh, everything else. Um, 10 or 15 years, I don't know. I don't know if they're still Well, there's be been an absolutely uh, catastrophic drop in the number of words that are written. I mean, in the United States, there is, I believe, no, two full time staff dance critics in the United States. Yeah, well, there's, there's 11 newspapers that still have full time classical. And, and the book review situation is simply unbelievable. It's just been, you know, uh, no, not this. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I don't know how long uh, uh, reviewing is going to last. We should yeah, think of something else. <laughs> Design cars, you know, make cookies. Um, well, there's certainly been a proliferation of online reviewing. Yeah, but, but do you know what it ends, by the way? Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the, well, I'll tell you what they pay for, you know. Um, it's $250 um, for, a, I mean, when I write a blog, I don't, you have your own blog. I mean, how do you do it? I always end up writing about 1,100 words or 1,200 words, you know? And they pay me $250. I mean, I could, you know, be like David and complain that I don't have enough to eat. It was true for like seven years. We didn't have enough food. Yeah, now people food. give me food. You're, you're, you're the only one on Twitter, right? Of the, of the four Am I? No, Alex. Yeah. I'm not. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know how I got sucked into that. <laughs> <laughs> I was really planning on, you know, here I was going to draw the line. You know, I had the blog and I got on the Facebook. But on the Twitter, I'm not going to do it. But, but actually, it is It's an amazing resource of... of of information, if I'm not wrong. Uh, it, I can just sort of s watch sort of the musical life, uh, this my specific field, unfolding uh, around the world uh, in, in a pretty mm -hmm. vivid way. And uh, uh, it's, it's actually, it's, it's another tool. I mainly use it as a tool for drawing attention to other people's articles, concerts, whatever else I, I find interesting. People should be aware of it. I don't really use it as a tool for communication <laughs> or uh, uh, 
expressing ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but you did, on the blog, use it as a supplement to your book and sort of added value for, for anyone who wanted to go there. Yeah. Yeah, that was also something I didn't intend to, to do when, when I first started, and, and uh, it's a required a mind of its own. But it turned out to be uh, you know, one, one of the great things about the internet, and there are many awful things about the internet as well. But but it, it, it does have this this amazing ability to uh, to en enrich uh, our, our our for for my field in, in music, uh, uh, the ability to supply audio samples. And, and, and videos, uh, you know, reproduction of documents. Uh, it, it, it can be an extraordinary supplement um, to traditional uh, long-form pieces. Uh, and, and someday, if you're sort of talking about the, the future, thinking of the future, you know, the notion that in uh, an all electronics or all digital journal, uh, all this material will be woven in. Uh, uh, to the fabric of the piece, uh, it, that, that's somewhat uh, <coughs> exciting to, to contemplate. As long as you know we don't lose the virtues of, of traditional long form journalism in, in the process. But actually, I, I think a, a way could be worked out that, that uh, you, you, you would still be reading a piece of tra 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 traditional structure, but uh, there would be these <coughs> these moments of, of additional supplementary materials along the side. You're, you're, you're hopeful for that. <laughs> and um, I'm just curious, The New Yorker, when you write a piece, do they demand that you <coughs> supplement it with an online something? Or no, no, no. it's all just... No, that, I mean, they ask us to blog. They, mm -hmm. um, um, well, there is one day, what was it, a year ago, he had us all in there. We thought we were all going to... Who was John Moore thought we were all going to be fired? <laughs> there were 12 of us around the table, and he said, uh, um, David Remnick said, you know, the, the wave of the future is, and I mean, Alex you could have said, knew... You're, you're going to write about the field of the person next to you. That <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's a very important thing, is at the New Yorker, uh, you're never allowed to go into anyone else's territory. Um, I mean, with, uh, sometimes there are little... Um, uh, border uh, fights. Uh, if something is on Broadway, which would be John Lahr or Hilton Alls, but it's all dance and there's no dialogue, which would be me, uh, uh, then there might be a discussion. Um, but but on the blogs, uh, that was one of the things that that uh, David Ramnick uh, offered to us as one of the great virtues of this is that we are allowed. I wouldn't even have to ask Alex if I wanted to write on just all those murder of his <laughs> wife. Um, the, uh, uh, but, but as I said, they pay very poorly. Um, I write them uh, uh, not as a public service, but as a, I write them because I see a lot of work that I do like that I don't have an assignment for and that they don't have room for. But on the blog, on the, the electronic edition, they have room for anything. So I do it, and also little <coughs> pet things. I always wanted to do a, a piece on teen dance movies, <laughs> like um, <laughs> um, Saturday Night Fever and stuff. They so, won't let you write that? Yeah, well, I blogged it. Okay. <laughs> but it, it was a lot of work. I, I watched a lot of teen dance movies. <laughs> <laughs> it was $50. Yeah. It was fun. <laughs> um, Yes, uh, I would like to get some practical advice how to go about it. I've written short, very short articles on the legal system many years, and I'm struggling with one thing. I mean, you have so much material together after a while, and so many ideas and topics and books. It's really practically how do you prove this to you? have a plan, first you map out the story, or... The question it? was for some nuts and bolts practical advice on how you structure a long piece put together. Um, I mean, I think the, the, best, the best advice I could give you is find pieces that are like the thing that you want to write and actually take them apart. And in that sense, you know, the New Yorker is a wonderful resource in the sense that 
the story forms tend to be um, pretty solid and they tend to repeat issue after issue after issue after issue after issue. And then there are people like David Grant who do, you know, very interesting and sometimes miraculous things with those story forms. But um, you can really stack up 15 crime stories, you know, read them all through, take a piece of paper, outline them. I can't write anything without outlining it. And, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And then I'm like, 15 is too much. How about 13? Mm -hmm. How about 9? How about 7? <laughs> you know, okay, 7, but it's 7A, 7B. <laughs> um, and then I know I've hit some, some wall, and that's the structure of the thing. And so looking, first of all, at, you know, what kind of thing is it that I want to write, finding other examples of that thing that are in a voice and publication that you imagine yourself writing for some version of, sitting with that stack, outlining how they're put together, and then outlining the thing that you want to do. You know, and there's a, I once heard this, um, this interview with, uh, with, with Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones, and someone asked him, you know, where did that, that Rolling Stones sound come from? You know, that thing that sounds like the Rolling Stones. Like, like, like where did that come from? And um, how, like, how did you make that? And, and, and he said, you know, well, you know, me and uh, Mick Jagger um, met when we were both students, and we both were really into uh, the blues, Chicago blues records. And so we used to buy these records and listen to them over and over again. And then we used to try to play what we heard note for note so that we'd sound exactly like Helen Wolf, you know, on the record. And of course the problem was like they were like skinny kids from England, they weren't black, you know, people from Chicago, and so they sounded really nothing like Howling Wolf. But like they were trying to reproduce it note for note, it just kind of came out really wrong. You know, and in doing so, like then it was the Rolling Stones sound. Yeah. And I thought that was probably as good Ravel as Ravel said the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, yes, he said to young composers, you, you imitate your models and, and when you fail, you become yourself. <laughs> well, the Beatles. Yeah, the Beatles. There's a consensus. They, they wanted to sound like Elvis. They wanted to sound like American rock and roll. Um, it, I'm going to give you a, a slightly more prosaic answer. Have a subject, have a deadline a deadline so that you can't think forever. And then outline, outline, outline. Um, you write what I call a scratch outline with, um, you know, what did you say, 15 is too many? Like 12 items, you have 12 major ideas about the thing, and then you plug what you've learned from your, make yourself stop reading at a certain point, um, and, uh, uh, and then you reread your reading notes and you plug them all into those subjects. As you do so, some subjects will uh, subdivide and become two subjects. Some will be thrown out and they, they'll be moved. And then you start writing from the outline. Remember always that you have an editor. So if you uh, have a terrible passage or a, a paragraph that shouldn't be there, she will help you very, at the New Yorker, she will take your <laughs> arm and, and you will be helped <laughs> to find your faults. It's very, you know, in many ways it's, a, it's not a mystical profession. Uh, have you noticed, have you found any particular new or newish outlets for long form reportage? online or otherwise that you are big fans of? Uh, cool. I think Triple Canopy is really great. I'm not a great like online person, so I always have to be directed by other people who are cooler and more plugged in than me, but I, I really do think that that's a great site. And actually, even though I don't follow sports or care about it, my friend got me into Grantland, which I read because it's funny and witty and the prose is often amazing and so um, those are two that I think are top-notch and totally different. One is super highbrow and one is sort of purportedly sort of just super popular but actually also has like amazing prose. Um, I, um, I find that um, the internet in 
not in a crude way, but in a more subtle way, really does impose its own logic and capacities on what's there. And so, like, you know, I, I really like Grantland too, although I still find the articles too long because the moment I go on line, my attention span just shortens. And then there's a really broad online attention span, which is kind of the archival one, where you're like, here's a huge archive of stuff that's available to you, and it's just like going to the library, and I can sit there for six hours. But it's not really like a reading experience, it's like a browsing experience. And, um, you know, and so long form, I, I, you know, I know everyone's all optimistic about this, and, and you know, longform.org is a great site, and they, they, they do a lot of good work putting out the kind of thing that I write, and, and I like those guys. Um, but it's, it's, it's hard for me to see people sitting in front of a laptop and reading long magazine articles. Like, it just doesn't, the, the experience of it doesn't work, because you can always go somewhere else. Like, you can get out of it too fast, and you kind of want to. You know, and so for, in a weird way, there's like a lack of functionality in the device, right? There's a lack of functionality in a book because it doesn't actually take you anywhere else. Like you have to throw I it away and get another book. I don't that I can't print out. You know, no, but I'm saying, but but there is the one the one thing that kind of interests me now are the tablet right. devices, and I do think that there are applications of the tablet device where you're carrying it around and essentially it will function like a magazine. So when I look at that and I start looking at you know. Um, I mean, obviously, Kindle Singles is sort of a horribly curated slush pile or whatever, but, but there's a model there where people will pay money and they will receive something and it will be downloaded on a tablet-like device and there will be a reading experience that's not really all that different once, once you get over technophobia than reading a magazine. And so, like, I can gin up some kind of hopefulness about something that could happen in two years. Are there, I mean, are there non-online? You know, do you see any sort of new places popping up in print? Um, well, N plus one, well, I mean, that's a while, I guess, but uh, N plus one, that yeah. excellent journal appeared. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, uh, what else? Um, uh, I mean, mostly it's in the other direction. They're dying. Yeah.